Take your Bibles, turn to 1 John, if you would. 1 John, and I'm excited about our little mini-series that we're having entitled Because, and we've learned that uh, we need to be uh, wise and we need to be real, and today we're going to learn about being prepared. And so I want you to open your Bible to 1 John uh, as we look at being prepared or being ready. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, let's stand together, please for our scripture reading. And if you don't have a Bible, you'll find most of the scriptures I'm going to quote right in the notes. Isn't that nice of me to put them in the notes? But here's the deal. I don't put them there so that you'll just throw those notes away. But let me encourage you, as you have private times with the Lord this week, take the outline back out and kind of go back over uh, the message and let it kind of resonate in your heart. And I think that would be a great, great thing for all of us this week. And so we're going to look at Be Prepared. Now, don't forget, next Sunday, we begin a brand new series entitled One Another. And we're going to begin, if you want to look ahead, in Romans chapter 12. What does it mean when the Bible says that we are many, uh, but we are together in the sense of being members one of another? And we're going to find that God has designed diversity with unity and that he intends in your family and in the church and amongst God's people uh, that we would encourage and edify and exhort and admonish. And we're going to look at 12 commandments in the next 12 weeks about how to work together with one another in uh, these days in which we live. And how many of you know the devil's trying to tear relationships apart and tear marriages apart? And for the next 12 weeks, we're going to find Bible tools for strengthening those relationships. And so that's next week, one another. But today we're going to look at this important subject of being ready for some of the greatest things in your life and for all of eternal life. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear... Don't forget that phrase. We're going to come back to that. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Is everybody ready this morning? Amen. That was weak. I want to make sure I'm at Lancaster Baptist Church. Is everybody ready this morning? All right, that's better. I just want to make sure because uh, we've got some great truth and the Bible is eternal and infallible and we want to get it this morning. So follow along with us. We're going to learn together. Let's pray. Father, bless the passage to our hearts. Illuminate our hearts. Help us to be alert and ready to receive. Thank you that we are in an air conditioning room where we can be alert and attentive. So Lord, teach us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, how many of you remember Y2K? Raise your hand if you remember that. You know, how many of you are amazed that it was 18 years ago, right? So some of the teenagers are like, Y2 who? What are you talking about, right? Well, Y2K, that's when all the computers were going to crash and all of the electronics were going to crash and there was going to be no water. And boy, there was, everybody was getting ready. In fact, I will confess, we put water in our tub so that we would have water in case everything crashed. And uh, we wanted to be ready for Y2K, and, and thankfully nothing happened, so we were prepared. And, and uh, I don't know if there's any preppers in the audience, but this message is going to be just for you, except with a very hopeful end. And so listen very, very carefully. But preparedness is a part of our lives. It's an important part of our lives. We have entire industries that are given to preparedness. We thank God for our military and for their preparedness. We thank God for firefighters and paramedics. They are ready at a moment to do something in case of an emergency. Preparedness is a part of our lives. I read recently about uh, a major earthquake that took place uh, down in the country of Chile, and uh, it was uh, 8.8 on the Richter scale. And this was back in 2010, and there were several hundred people who lost their lives because of that particular earthquake. But then I continued reading it that same year, a few months later, there was an amazing earthquake in the country of Haiti. And this particular earthquake was only 7.0 on the Richter scale. But what amazed me as I read about it was the fact that with the quake in Haiti, there were 220,000 lives lost. Lesser magnitude, 
220,000 lives. Imagine that, the entire population of Lancaster gone because of one earthquake. And as I began to kind of look at that, I thought, what in the world? What's the difference? And I began to find out that uh, there were various aspects in Chile that uh, helped the Chileans. For example, they had seismologists that were constantly monitoring the movements of the earth. They had various electronic equipment to help them uh, prepare and even warn their citizens about the impending results, perhaps tsunamis and things of this nature. Uh, they also had very strong building codes, and because of that, the steel was very formidable in most of their buildings, as opposed to Haiti, which is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, and most of their buildings were not well built at all. And so the conclusion of the matter simply stated was that Chile was more prepared for the earthquake and had less damage. And I want to speak to you today about how to be prepared for the greatest event in the history of the world other than perhaps the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in Bethlehem's manger. And as we begin the message, we begin in verse 1 with a very important word, and I want you to see it. It's the word behold. Let's all say that word together. Behold. And this word behold means something wonderful is about ready to be unveiled. And it is something that God wants us to physically, spiritually, and emotionally focus on. That's why he says behold. We don't see that word a lot in the Bible. But he says, I want you to behold this I want you to think about this. That's why I said, are you ready? Because we're preaching a message on being ready. And so we want to make sure that we behold what we're about to read. Now, when we consider this matter of the coming of the Lord, when we consider the truth I read to you a moment ago, that He shall appear. Sometimes people get nervous about, oh boy, the end times, the battle of Armageddon, the great tribulation and all of these types of subjects. But as we think about it this morning, the first thing I want you to jot down is this simple phrase, a prepared position. God wants you to be positioned for the end times. He wants you to be prepared in your position. And we're going to see what that position is. It is the love of the Father. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But again, if you're, if you're expecting something great, if you're expecting and looking ahead to a changing of events, you want to be prepared for that. For example, uh, we have a, a Christian school and a Christian Bible college here, and, and we have earthquake drills for the school, and we teach the children, crawl under the desk, you know, stand up beneath a door, a door post or whatever, and we want them to be in a place of safety. Uh, if, there is a, uh, if there is a fire drill, we teach them how to get out and roll in the grass, or maybe at home to roll in a fire-protected blanket or uh, we teach them to find a place in the dirt or the pool or someplace safe if there's a fire. I've told the church before, if there's ever an active shooter situation, just get in between these chairs, just fall down in the midst of that. And there are men prepared uh, to take out that situation in every service at Lancaster Baptist Church. Why? Because preparedness is key in the day in which we live. And God says, I want you to be prepared for these end times, and so I want you to take your position. I want you to be in a safe position. And what is that position? I want you to notice that we are positioned in the love of God. Positioned in the love of God. Did you see what it said? Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Now, how many of you today believe that God loves you? Let me see your hands. All right, the devil might make you doubt that sometime. God loves you. And I don't know about you, but one of the saddest things to me is to see this. To see the love of a parent towards a child, but it's not reciprocated. Or the love of a spouse towards a spouse, but it's, it's not reciprocated. And God says, I want you to know what manner of love I have for you. But how silly would it be as we enter the last days if we were not covered in and protected by the love of God? That's why I put a verse in your notes this morning, Jude in verse 21. I want you to see it there. It says this. By the way, isn't that nice of me to put those in there for you? All right, just trying to help you out here. Keeping it moving here. Jude in verse 21. Notice what it says. Keep yourselves how? in the love of God, or where? Keep yourselves in the love of God. So when you're saved, you realize, boy, he loves me. He died on the cross for me, and I'm covered by his love. And the Bible says in the Psalms that I'm, I'm under the shadow of the wing of the Almighty. That's a wonderful place to be, but many Christians just walk out from it. 
And they begin to try to handle things on their own. But God says, I want you to be safely positioned in my love. And by the way, this love is a very sacrificial love. The Bible says in John and verse 15, greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Folks, you don't have to earn it. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to try to perform to get it. He loves you unconditionally the way you are. You don't need to be depressed about it. God says, look it, I want you to know I'm covering you with my love. And that love that God has for you is why Jesus went to Calvary. It's a very secure love. That's why Jesus said this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, he said, that where I am, there ye may be also. In other words, Jesus wants us to know that he's got us covered, both for now and for all of eternity. And he says, you are my sons, and I love you, and I'm covering you in my love. So as we approach tumultuous times, or perhaps unknown times, God says, be positioned in his love and then you will be protected by his love. Now, why do you need God's covering and protection? Well, not only to forgive us for sin, and certainly that's the most important reason, because if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you need to turn from whatever you're trusting in and trust in Christ as your Savior and let his blood cover your sin. And and that's so vitally important. But also you can be protected by his love in an ongoing way. And I'll tell you why that's important. Look at verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Watch this. That we should be called the sons of God. Notice, Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Now this world doesn't know your God. They don't care about your God. This world doesn't really know what this is all about to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The world does not love the church. And sometimes you, you're going to experience that. People are going to put you down. They're going to say things about you because you go to church, because you're trusting in the Lord. They're going to say, look at, yeah, prayer is fine, but you better do this and this and this. And sometimes the world can be very cutting. The Bible says in John 15, 17, these things I command you that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Let me just say, when someone puts you down for your faith, just remember they hated Jesus Christ as well. And that's a part of the Christian life. There's there's an increasing disdain in America for God, for the things of God, even for the name of Jesus Christ. And God knew that we would live in a hostile environment. And sometimes we might feel like, wow, I mean, no one really cares and, and, and everyone hates the fact that we follow Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you of Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. It says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? Paul said in Romans 8, 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, uh, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what happens in society. God says, I've got you covered in my love. I will take care of you. Make sure that you are positioned in the love of God. David Livingston was an amazing missionary, and and really after the Reformation time, the church began to really get a hold of the gospel, uh, the scriptures, sola scriptura. They began to trust in the Bible, and and they began to realize the power of the gospel. And and during the 1700s and 1800s, there was an amazing missionary movement that began. And Christians began to say, if salvation is by grace and through faith, then we got to tell the rest of the world. And so they began going everywhere. And One young man that was saved in Scotland was named David Livingston, and he surrendered his life to be a missionary to Africa. By the way, moms and dads, let's always be willing and happy if God would call one of our children to be missionaries somewhere. And God called David Livingston to be a missionary to Africa, and and so he went on his way. And if you ever visit London and you walk into Westminster Abbey, you'll find the very first memorial marker right there in the middle of that huge church in England is where David Livingston is buried, except for his heart, because he had instructed, bury my heart on the mission field. And David Livingston is a wonderful example of testimony for the Lord Jesus. And 
He was visiting back in Scotland, and as he was back in Scotland for a few months, he was asked to give a short speech. And he was gaunt and in poor health and holding his left arm from a recent lion attack. And he said these words, Would you like me to tell you what supported me through all the years of exile among people whose language I could not understand and whose attitude toward me was always uncertain and often hostile? It was this. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. And the same Jesus who said those words to his disciples, and the same Jesus that comforted David Livingston in Africa, is the same Jesus that's with you, and he says, Lo, I am with you always, even until the very end, I am with you. Jesus is telling us, hey, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. He has got you covered in his love today. How many of you are thankful for that this morning? We want to make sure that we're positioned properly in the love of God, a prepared position. Why is that important? Because there's a lot to come in the near future in this world. And the greatest, greatest victory for us that is just to come is what I want you to notice secondly, and that is a prominent appearance. There's a prominent appearance. You see, before the coming of the Lord, it's going to be difficult. We're going to need to be covered in His love. But look at what the Bible says here in verse 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, notice this now, when He shall appear. Would you say that with me? When He Here's the prominent appearance. The word appear means to manifest or to make visible. And this is speaking letter A about Christ's appearance. And this is saying God's going to love you to the very end and then suddenly something will happen. He, Jesus, will appear. And the Bible speaks of this and it's in your notes, Titus 2 and 13. And it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And let me just pause to say to you very quickly that in in that verse, the phrase, that great God and the word Savior are synonymous because Jesus is God, Amen. right? Many false churches like the Mormon church teach that Jesus was a man who became a God, but we believe Jesus is eternal God, and we don't believe that Jesus is like little God, but we believe that he is the great God, and this verse bears that out, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice, and so it says we're looking for the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope of the Christian? Is it someone new that gets, uh, uh, gets elected into public office? Is it a raise at work? Is it uh, some new friendship or relationship? No. The blessed hope of us who are Christians is the appearing one day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we speak of this at his appearance at a time known as the rapture or the catching away. In fact, notice in your notes there, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up uh, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The word caught up there speaks of being seized or carried away. It is uh, in the Latin, raptura. It is the rapture. And so God says one day uh, the Lord Jesus will come and he will catch away his children. In fact, the apostle Paul spoke of it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. He said, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which is the uh, uh, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. I want you to know that this crown of righteousness is not just for the Apostle Paul, but he said, for everybody that keeps looking for the blessed hope, for everybody who lives their life with Jesus coming in mind, there is going to be a crown of righteousness given to them. And so we see that his appearance will take place at a time called the rapture when we are caught away. Now, sometimes when I speak about the rapture, I think it's important to just delineate between the rapture and the second coming. Now, we will use sometimes a general term that is called the return of the Lord 
Lord in reference to this entire framework of time. Sometimes it's called the day of the Lord. But I want you just to see that this series of events begins with the rapture. And you'll notice right now we're living in the church age or the age of grace. But the church will be caught away at this time of rapture. And, and then for seven years on this earth, there will be a period of tribulation. At first, it will look like the Antichrist is bringing peace, but suddenly he will break agreements with the false church, and suddenly there will come judgment and war after war and bloodshed and great persecution on anyone who believes on Jesus Christ. And at the end of that seven years, there will take place an event known as the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you'll see a little bit about that in your notes, his revelation at the second coming. And the Bible tells us about this. Uh, First of all, it will take place at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Revelation 19 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. This is a picture of Jesus Christ coming now down to this earth. And the Bible says that this battle of Armageddon, that all the armies of the world will come against as the Antichrist endeavors to fight against the Lord Jesus. But the Bible says that Jesus will come, Revelation 19, 13, with his vesture dipped in blood. This means he's coming in judgment and he's coming in vengeance. By the way, thank God that we who have already been raptured will not be on the earth at this time, but that we will be coming with him at this time. The armies of heaven uh, will destroy the armies of the earth, Revelation 19 and verses 14 through 20. All of these armies will gather together at the valley of Megiddo. And, and I want you to understand something, friend. All of the nuclear arsenals from all of the countries in the world pointed at Jesus Christ will fail because Jesus Christ is coming to establish his kingdom on this earth. Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ 1,000 years. You see, there is a plan that God has, and it will unveil. And the beginning of that plan is going to be his appearance. And at his appearance, he will capture all of us away who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's why it's vital that every one of us, while we are on this earth, take time to make sure that we have turned to Christ as our Savior. In fact, not only will he appear at the time of the, of the rapture or his appearance, as it says in this verse, but at that time, there will also be our transformation. And I want you to see that because it's in this verse. Notice what it says in verse number two. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now notice that phrase there, we shall be like him. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. Let's say that together. We shall be like him. One more time. We shall be like him. Now, how many of you can say, wow, what a day that will be? Amen. Finally, when we see the Lord, we're going to receive a glorified body, a, a glorified and renewed mind. We will be like him him. Philippians says in 3 and 20, for our conversation, our lifestyle is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Now, how many of you reckon this morning that our bodies are corruptible? Our bodies are, are, are of the Adamic nature. How many of you are like me? When you get up in the morning, it's like snap, crackle, pop. And some of you this morning would understand what I'm talking about. You're taking medicine for this, you're taking medicine for that. We have doctor's appointments and dental appointments. Why? Because this vile body tends to fall apart. But the Bible says when we see the Lord, uh, when we see him face to face, he will change our vile body and he'll make it like unto his glorious body. We understand that Jesus Christ, when he was 33 and a half years old, suffered and died on the cross, but then he was resurrected to be with the Father 
Father. We understand that when he came back to this earth and showed himself alive by many infallible proofs that he was perfect and he was whole. In fact, he even walked through walls on one occasion and appeared before his disciples. And God says that we are also going to have a perfect and a glorified body. Now, I don't understand how that's going to take place exactly. I just know I'm looking forward to it. How many of you are looking forward to that? Amen. There'll be no Advil in heaven. Right? There'll be no pain. There'll be no Percocet. There'll be no need for counseling and psychology. There'll be no drugs there. Why? Because we will be whole finally. We will be like him. Like him. I heard of an old farmer. He went to New York City. And uh, he and his boys and his wife, and they'd never been there before. And they saw all these cars and big buildings and, and technology and signboards. And it just blew them away. And they were standing there in, in the lobby of a building, and I believe it was in New York, uh, or was the uh, Empire State Building, and they were, they were standing there, and, and they kept watching people going in through these doors. The doors would close, this dial on top, and then, boom, people would come out. And they watched this one lady that walked in, and she had a lot of physical ailments, and she was struggling to walk. She was very disheveled in her look, a uh, very, very difficult situation. And they walked as she walked into the Doors and the doors closed and the dial went around and the doors opened and out walked a beautiful young lady. Everything was perfect about her. And the farmer said to his boys, boys, get your mother. We're going to run her through that thing, see what happens. <laughs> now, I don't think we're going to get run through something. But at the moment we see Christ, you're not going to need your plastic hip anymore. The moment we see Christ, you're not going to need that bridge in your mouth anymore. For we shall be like him. In fact, look at 1 Corinthians 15. It's in your notes. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, not everyone's going to die. There are going to be some people that are raptured away and never see death. How many of you would like to be in that number right there? Folks, you got to get with the program here. I'm going to ask that question one more time. And let me read the verse. It says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means we will not all die, but we shall all be changed. How many of you would like to be in the group of people that do not sleep, but are changed and instantly see the Lord in the rapture? Amen. Amen. That's what we're talking about. The rapture, the catching away. But look at verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall shall be changed. There it is again. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You see, when the rapture takes place, and when we see the Lord Jesus Christ, at that very moment, this old corruptible body, this body that has fillings in its teeth, and this body that needs Advil to walk sometimes, listen, this corruptible will put on incorruption when we see Christ. And that's why when we sing songs like, when we see Christ, and what a day that will be, that ought to mean something into our hearts. I was with my brother Steve a couple weeks ago, and we were at a restaurant. We like to spend time together when we can, and a lady came up in the restaurant. She was taking her order, and, and uh, she took my order, and then she said to my brother, she looked at him, and she looked at me, and she said, and what would your son like? <laughs> now, I don't know if that's his youthfulness or my aging. I'm not sure which one it is. It just didn't quite feel right when she said that, you know. But when we see Christ, what a day that will be. We will be changed. So from now until our blessed hope, we want to stay in this position of the love of God. What manner of love the Father hath. He's got us covered. Then there's going to be this promised appearance. And we see that here in verse number two. He shall appear. And I want you to see a final admonition in the light of all this. Verse number three speaks of it. And I want you to see this. We must be until then a purified people. A purified people. Look at verse three. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now, folks, just listen for a second. I've been, I've been pastoring here for 32 years and I've been preaching the gospel every Sunday of my life for 37 years. I don't have it all down, but I've read it through a good number of times. And there are those that would say, well, I'm already in Christ, purified and sanctified, therefore I don't have to do anything else. And by the way, don't you bother telling me anything else to do. And what they misunderstand is the difference between our positional sanctification 
and then also the ultimate sanctification or the progress of sanctification that we experience in our everyday life. So for example, yes, if you are saved, you have been purified and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't do one more thing to go to heaven. But there is a progressive sanctification. And in other words, yes, the gospel is something we should be thankful for, and the, the death, burial, and resurrection should be our motivation. But the commands of the Word of God are given to us that we might follow. For example, one verse says it this way, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That does not mean we work to get salvation. It means once we have it, we should let it come out. Can I get an amen on that? Right? One verse says that we are His workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. We are His workmanship. That does not mean uh, that we work to get our salvation. It means God creates us that we might continue serving Him. Now look at this verse, for example. It says, every man that has this hope purifieth himself. So what does that mean? If I'm already forgiven, if I'm already washed, what does it mean? i got to purify myself. Well, I want you to understand this verse as we close this morning. First of all, who are the people who prepare? Who's this written to? It's not to an unsafe person telling them to get their act together. Verse 3, every man that hath this hope in him. Would you say that with me? Every man that hath this hope. So that's speaking to the believer. So the believers are being told to purify themselves. Every man that has the hope of Jesus In fact, Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So this is speaking to the children of God. And so it's it's for us, the Bible says, to purify ourselves. Positionally, we're purified, we're forgiven, but we also purify ourselves. So what's the process of that? How do we as Christians purify ourselves? Well, let's look at the word, okay? The word purifieth uh, is an interesting word, and it refers back to the ceremonial cleansing of the Old Testament saints. The ceremonial cleansing of the Old Testament uh, uh, saints, and particularly the priest in the Levitical era. So in fact, what would happen was the Old Testament priests, when they would come into the temple, God created what was known as the, as the brass laver for them, and they would come to that laver and they would wash their hands in that laver, and God commanded them, before you go into the temple, I want you to wash your hands in the laver. I, wa- I do not want you to handle the sacrifices. I do not want you to handle the furniture with impure hands, God says. Make sure that your hands are washed. Now listen to what he says to us in 1 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord, which is what we're talking about, the end times, the time when he will appear, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. In other words, seeing that the end will come, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth someday. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. Notice this question. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? In other words, if you believe that Jesus is coming again, how's that going to change your life? What kind of a person should we be in our conversation in all holiness and godliness? What kind of a person should we be? And the answer is we should be a purified person. Not only should we be saved, but we should purify ourselves from the filthiness of this world, from the things the Holy Spirit conveys us about. 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Let me say that again. Let us cleanse ourselves. In other words, there comes a place where we say, Lord, I know that this is wrong. And I'm going to tell you how to cleanse yourself in just a moment. But I want you to see that we do have a responsibility in the matter of sanctification. If you're with me on this, say amen so far. We have our part in the matter of sanctification. Let me illustrate it this way. Uh, if someone came up to you after church and said, hey, we don't know how this happened, but uh, that uh, uh, there's a president that's come to our country and he's visiting our country here. Let's just say the queen. Let's just say uh, that the queen, uh, queen uh, is here from England and we don't know why, but she wanted to go to your house. I have a little sense that some of you would hurry home. Right? Maybe not even the queen. Maybe if someone said, hey, pastor's going to drop by this afternoon. Some of you would say, okay, we're going to hurry home. 
and you would probably do some straightening up. How many of you are with me right here? Right? And, and we, would, we would get ready. I mean, if we believe that there's this coming event, then it's going to motivate us in the meantime to get some things changed. And, and I remember years ago when I was just starting as an assistant pastor in ministry, uh, I had to learn a hard lesson as a young married man. And I, I met a couple of, that was visiting our church, and I went to Terry, and I said, Hey, honey, uh, these folks are visiting the church, and, and uh, I invited them over for lunch today. I mean, like five minutes before lunch. If you're a young married, that's not a good idea to do that. In fact, that's suicidal to do that. <laughs> Thankfully, I have a gracious and godly wife. And uh, she did cry. And we went to 7-Eleven. We had no food at home. Went to 7-Eleven. She said, you go tell them we need 20 minutes. And I, we went to 7-Eleven. We bought, I think we bought some ramen and some tuna. How many of you are with me? That's good food. Ramen and tuna. We ran back to our little apartment. We cleaned it up and vacuumed everything. And, and, and Terry got a little ramen going. And when they walked in, we're like, oh, come on in. We're so glad you're here. Fact of the matter is, we had to get ready for the company. I have since learned, always give your wife advance notice when you have company coming over. Because when you expect an upcoming event, you get yourself ready for that moment. Look at 2 Peter 3.11. If seeing all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons or what kind of person should you be? If Jesus Christ came next Friday night at 9 o'clock, what kind of person should you be? Oh, hey, welcome, Jesus. I don't think so. I think that if we believe he's coming, it would change the way we're living. Can I get an amen on that? I think we might check our heart and purify some things in our life. We would make sure that there was nothing in our heart that was displeasing to the Lord. Now, someone says, well, how do you do that? Well, I've already mentioned one way through prayer. But look at another way, 2 Peter 1.4. How do we purify our own hearts? 2 Peter 1.4. Wherefore, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. This speaks of the Bible. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It is only by the word of God that we can be purified. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to his word. You see, God is calling us to take the word and apply it to our Say, Why do we emphasize getting to the house of God and getting to church and reading the Bible during the weekend? Why do we emphasize so much the more as we see the day approaching? Why, Pastor Chapel, all of this emphasis? I'll tell you why. Because I believe that Jesus shall appear. And the job of the pastor, in part, is to get the church ready for when Jesus appears. And friends, if you believe that he will appear, it will affect the way that you live each and every week. John Newton said this. He said, I'm not what I might be. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I wish to be. I'm not what I hope to be. But I thank God that I am not what I once was. And I can say with the great apostle, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you prepared for the coming of the Lord? And may I say, no one is prepared unless they have trusted Him as their Savior. No one is prepared unless they have put their faith in Jesus Christ and had their sins forgiven. But you may be a Christian, and there may be some purifying that needs to take place. You need to apply the Word of God to your heart and find cleansing. There might be something in your life that Jesus wants to change today, let me encourage you, be ready, be ready for the coming of the Lord.